So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. It's a great and wonderful thing, a marvelous thing to come to the house of God, right? This building is not the church, but it's the building where the church gathers. It's in this building that when we come together, let me tell you what that meant to the people in the New Testament. After the ascension of Christ and the descent in the Holy Spirit of God, when they spoke about gathering together, when they would come together, right, they, to them it represented, hallelujah, uh, it represented the day that they would gather together in the clouds to be with Jesus forever. Now that's powerful. That's what it meant to them. It didn't mean anything else to them. It didn't mean to exercise their talents, to exercise their gifts. It didn't mean for them to show out more than anybody else. It didn't mean for them to, to be looking at other people's faults and other people's shortcomings. It exemplified. It was a shadow. It was a pattern of that day when they met Christ in the air to be with him forever. That's what it was about. And that's what it should be about us. Nothing more, nothing less, but hey, we're going to, just like we come together here to praise and worship God and give God the glory, amen, one day we're going to meet Jesus in the clouds and there we shall be with him always. That should be the things that are most hoped for. Hebrews 11.6, right? Hebrews 11.6 11 speaks, 11, speaks about faith. is the substance of things hoped for. It's the substance of things hoped for. What is it that you're hoping for? Huh? If you have an earthly hope, if you have an earthly desire, if there's something here on earth that you want to accomplish, there's nothing wrong with that. But if it's more than the heavenly hope, then there's a problem. Because it's always going to be seen in my walk. It's always going to be seen in my walk. But if, if I'm hoping for, first and foremost, if my priority, hallelujah, is to spend eternity with God, then my walk will bear witness of that. Not my words, but my walk. My conduct, my behavior, the lifestyle that I lead. I've said this plenty of times, and, 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 and I reiterate that because that's what God has put in my spirit. Uh, and I'll always reiterate that because we say a lot of things with our mouths. There's no knock on anybody, but it's the truth. We say a lot of things with our mouths, but then, and, but then the fruit is far from it. The old saying, actions speak louder than words. And if you look at Christ's teaching, he always taught that. Your actions speak louder than, it got to line up. They got to line up. So it's important for us to understand that, amen? Just a few minutes ago, that song said that the seed I receive will be the one that I sow. That's important, right? The seed that I receive. What is the seed that you receive? If, you're, if you receive a seed of grace, if you receive a seed of mercy, compassion, and love, that's the same one you're going to be sowing. See, that's your words and your actions lining up. That's my words and my actions lining up. What I received is what I'm going to sow. God, hallelujah. So before we, uh, uh, we, before we go on to, uh, to turn the part over to evangelist Will Nieves, we're going to collect the offering, amen? We're going to do that. Uh, but it's important. See, a lot of people feel like the tithes and the offerings, uh, that that was under the law, that that was the law that God gave Moses, Right? And that when Christ died on the cross, all that came to an end. It is finished. It is done. All the things of the law. In the New Testament now, we don't have to pay tithes and offerings. Right? But that's a lie from the pit of hell. I dare to tell you that. Because 430 years before the law, Abraham paid his tithe. Did you know that? And before the flood, Cain and Abel came before God. With their offering. This has nothing, your tithes and your offering have nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with church. It has nothing to do with the pastor. Your tithes and your offering got to do with the earth and the fullness belongs to God. 
Therefore, since it does, I'm going to acknowledge that by giving you what you deserve, my first fruits, the best, the cream of the crop. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy deceive you and make you believe something else. That's something that God called for way before the law. And that's something that we as believers are responsible, amen, to pay our tithes and our offerings. Specifically our tithes. That's a debt that you owe to God. That belongs to God. That's a debt. When you pay that, it's like I told you next week. People pay their tithes. With last week, we're thinking that it's going to take them to the next level. No, it don't. Or because I pay my tithes, they're going to give me an increase at my job. That don't work like that. That's the debt that you owe God, period. You're giving back to God what God, God, I told you, the government comes and takes theirs off the top, and you don't even complain about it. And if you do, dare not to pay it and see who they send for you. Huh? So it's important for us to understand that, that that is a debt that we have for God. We pay it. We get it out the way. And the same thing with offering. Offering is something totally different. As I explained to you last week, it's something totally different. Why? Because the offering is, that's where the sacrifice comes in. Amen? That's where it comes in, all right? So uh, uh, I'm going to be handing out so that you guys have that information on tithes and offering. You guys can have it. You can take it home. You can do whatever. You know, read it, study it, learn it. Amen? Because, once again, you know, uh, we're children uh, uh, of the light, and, and, and we're supposed to obey the word of God. Amen? A lot of people, a lot of pastors, they don't like to speak that. They don't like to talk about that. They don't want to get involved with the offering and the tithe. But listen good. God called Moses to call the people, and he, he gave them the pattern to how to ask for offering. So that's pride. And we're not going to play that here. Now, I ain't gonna, whether you give it or not, it's between you and God. I ain't going to get involved with that, but I'm going to give you the word of God, the full gospel. Not part of it. Why? Because if your pastor really loves you and he really cares for you, right, he's going to teach you the truth completely. He's going to put it in your lap. He's going to put it in your hand. And what you do with it, that's between you and God. But we're going to give you the truth. Amen? Praise God. So we're going to ask for evangelist uh, Willie Nevis to come up. God has blessed him with a supernatural talent to play that trumpet. Amen? So uh, he who has an ear, listen to what the Spirit has to say to you today through the music, but also through, uh, through the ministering that he'll do. Amen? So with no further ado, Hallelujah. How many can praise the Lord? Can, how many can say hallelujah? One of my favorite verses, the Lord inhabits in the praise of his people. Like your pastor says, thank you, pastor, for having me. It's an honor and a privilege being in this beautiful church. Just to share what the Lord has placed in my life for, for many years now. Uh, like the pastor said, my name is uh, Brother Willie Nieves. I'm an evangelist, a worshiper. And before I continue, I would like to introduce my beautiful wife, Marie. Marie, please stand and say, God bless. She's a, a, a godly woman with a lot of patience, dealing with me for 31 years. Pray for her. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. Amen. Now, we're changing that phrase. It's God is great. God is great. Amen. And um, I know there were a few people here the last time that the pastor invited me for uh, something, an event in the afternoon. But um, I just would like to share shortly uh, my background. My parents are originally from Puerto Rico. They met in New York City in the Bronx, going towards work. My mother was a beautiful, gorgeous woman. My father said, yeah, that's it. That's, that's her. That's her. That's my beautiful, my future wife. And they started talking and and dating, and they got married, and, and once they got married, they started seeking for a girl, and they ended up with seven boys. Seven boys. So we got the basketball team. And uh, it, it, for me, every morning, I just thank the Lord 
for blessing me with godly parents. The Bible says in Proverbs, instruct your kids when they're, you know, in the, in the path of the Lord, when be old, they will never apart from the path of God. And that's a, a promise from the world that you will be saved and also your family will be saved. And in uh, 1973, my parents decided to go back to Puerto Rico, and the Lord had a calling upon my parents, and they, they founded, uh, they started a new church in uh, St. Just Trujillo Alto, a town in the metropolitan area of San Juan, Puerto Rico, close to the airport. And um, they pastored for 36 years, that church. My mom, that was her passion. My, my mom had a, a strong, strongly passion for Christ and uh, passion for the church, her, her calling, her assignment. And um, the church that God gave my mom was about a block, a block away, or maybe a block and a half away. And every morning at 6.30 in the morning, she would go to the church by herself, open the church, and she had a special corner. And she would go on her knees and pray for a couple of hours every day. And they have service almost every day. And my mom always start the service and then give it to the worship leader. You know? And um, I've learned a lot through my mom you know, as a worshiper. When I was a little boy in, in the Bronx, my mom used to sing in the choir. And I, I would really admire that choir because they sound like angels singing. But my mom, in, in my home, she, she would continue to pray. She would always be worshiping and singing to God. That was her passion. And uh, I've learned a lot. You know, I was a little boy, like eight years old. And I remember um, I, was, I got operated for my tonsils when I was a little boy. I used to snore a lot. And it's, I, had, I had a you know, problem with my tonsils. So they operated my tonsils, and I was a couple of days home without going to school. My, my PJs, I remember. It was like something you know, I have it in my mind. And uh, my mom, while she was cleaning the house, she had these long planes, the long planes and, and these classic hymns. And while my mom was cleaning the house, she would sing and praise God. And I was to be like seven or eight years old, and, and I just looked at my mom like, my mom's crazy. And I look around, you know, and I said, Mom, why are you singing? There's no one here. We're not in church. Are you crazy? You know, and then she started teaching me. That when we are in Christ, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple. When, when you receive Christ as your personal Savior, we are the temple. Your body's the temple. That's why we have to take care of this temple and be careful. And everywhere we go, doesn't matter where you are, you can praise and worship God. I always say this. I, I mean, I like to say this a lot. Can you imagine... Tuesday or Wednesday at 1 30 in the afternoon in Walmart in a very long line because the cash, you know, the young lady, she's starting and she's like confused and she doesn't know what she's doing. And there's a long line. And you're right there in that long line being patient. Oh my God. But instead of complaining right there, you could praise God. You could worship God. It doesn't have to be screaming like a crazy person, but right there's all. Oh, Thank you, Jesus. I pray for the cash. Bless her, Lord. Bless her. Bless her. Give her wisdom. Amen. Yeah. Instead of being impatient and complaining, you can worship God. And you never know. Maybe the person that's standing right in front of you is going through a tremendous trial and problems and hardship, you know. You can just, with a lot of respect, tap that person on the shoulder and say, you know what? I just feel telling you, Jesus loves you. That's it. And right there, that person just like starts weeping, you know, because she felt God. And we are the temple. We have God in our life. We, we have the presence of God. Amen? And, you know, a lot of people just need the, the touch from God. I mean, you can say amen. So my oldest brother, Hiram, he inspired me to play trumpet. He used to play trumpet in the band, school band. And also in the church, we had, there was a lot of youth, like seven, seven years apart from me. I'm the old, my oldest brothers. 
And my oldest brother, Jaime, used to play trumpet and trombone. But he was like, I, I, I um, compare him with, Paul, with Peter, boldly, you know. And once in a while, once in a while, in our big service Sunday night, my brother would come up to the front by himself and play a solo with the trumpet or the trombone. There was no tracks, no music, nothing those days. He would just play a solo, a trombone, a trumpet by himself. And I would be in the back with my twin brother and, and my, my friends. I'd say, wow, look at my brother. He's playing by himself, you know. But it would sound so beautiful. And he really inspired me. And at the age of 14, I, I, I said, you know what? I want to play trumpet like my oldest brother, Hiram. And he was already, a, you know, a, a, a teenager in his early 20s. You know, and um, he had a heavy schedule. He didn't have time to teach me. But he had an old beat-up trumpet, and he bought a brand-new trumpet. And that old trumpet, it looked like a penny, all dark and beat-up, you know. And he threw it aside. I said, wait, man. I, I took that trumpet and hugged it, and I prayed to God. I said, God, teach me how to play like my brother Hiram. You know, how many here know that... God has a divine purpose for every one of us here. God has a divine purpose for you and for me. And since God has had that, has that uh, 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 calling and assignment, purpose in my life, I pray to God, and God taught me how to play this instrument. I didn't have to go to school. I wanted to go to school, but God taught me how to play this instrument. And it's been a, a journey for more than 33 years already that I've been worshiping, praising God with this biblical and prophetic instrument called a trumpet. How do you know that Jesus is coming soon? He's coming and a trumpet is going to sound. Trumpet of God. Amen? So we have to be ready to hear that trumpet. Amen? So let's, let's try the trumpet. See everything is working here. I want to thank the, uh, the, the sound guy. Thank you for your help. Bible says in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. See, this is my situation. I was born and raised in a very charismatic church. So I got I know there's some Spanish people here, and I know they understand me. Spanish people are kind of loud. They're kind of loud. But it's because we've learned through the Bible that when you shout, something happens. When the, the, the people of Israel confronted um, Jericho, they shout. And when they shouted, the walls came crumbling down. But if they wouldn't shout, the walls would still be up there. There's something about when you, when you raise your, your voice, when you raise your praise, like I said before, the Lord inhabits in the praise of his people. So the church that was born and raised in the Bronx, it was a church that there was people always constantly praising God. There was hardly a moment of, of silence. There was always something. Hallelujah! Glory to you! Amen! Jesus! There's always people praising God. And I realized that when the people started praising and worshiping God, God started moving His presence. Because the Lord inhabits in the praise of His people. So the move of God started moving among us. We need the presence of God. We need the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because many of us, we all have problems. In our homes, sometimes we have problems with our kids. Some have problems with their marriage. Or maybe the neighbor. We all have problems. And we come with that burden, that load in our shoulder. And we need the presence of God to be released. To let loose and get set free. How many believe in that? So let's, let's try our best to raise our praise 
That way the Holy Spirit will manifest and move among us. And we can feel his power and presence. I believe in that. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. I've learned that there is power in praise and worship. I am a witness of the mighty power of God. And I am a witness of the power of praise and worship. And throughout 30 years, Lord, I've seen the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit through praise and worship. Amen? And um, I want you to pray for me because I'm writing my first book. And this uh, book has to do with uh, the character of a true worshiper. And one of the characteristics of a true worshiper that's very vital and very important is the anointing of God in our lives. And you might say, Brother Willie, I'm not anointed. I don't have no anointing. But the Bible says in the epistle of St. John, chapter 2, verse 20, we have the anointing of the, uh, the Holy One. How many have read that verse? When you come to Christ, he seals you. And he plants in your, his anointing. But it's, your, it's our responsibility to make that anointing grow. Through our, and how does it grow? Through our intimacy with God. Through our intimacy with God, our prayer life, lifestyle praying, worshiping. So I have some classics in that. But I'm just, I'm going to do something that my wife's going to be crazy. She's going to say, what are you doing? I'm going to do something for the first time. I'm going to play some of my hymns, but I'm going to shorten them. I'm, I'm going to just play for one minute and a half. Now I could play more, more songs. You like that idea? And I'm sure you're going to recognize these uh, beautiful hymns. That This was my first, my first project that I did in 1989. And for me, I have five, five productions, five CDs. But this one, that first one, was for me, it's a special one because it's really for, for um, it's great for people that want to take this music and, like my mom used to say, you have to lock yourself in your closet of prayer. El closet de oración. Métete en tu closet de oración. Métete con Dios. You know, you want to have an intimacy with God? Lock yourself in the closet with God. It's just you and God. Forget about Facebook, Instagram, TV, your friends. Forget about everybody. And just lock yourself with God only. And this music, I we have a lot of testimonies from glory of God, how people have been real blessed with this plastic hymn. How many of you have experienced the greatness of God? How many of you see the greatness of God in your life? I'm sure everyone here has a testimony. But since I have the mic, my second daughter, my wife, she was pregnant with Stephanie Nicole. And the doctor saw something strange. Just the blood chromosome. The doctor said, I need to see you, Mr. Nieves, in my office. I said, sure. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, but I have bad news. Your daughter is going to it's going to be abnormal. She's going to be born with no neck or like a, a pretzel. And I started thinking and meditating God. And I said, Doctor, you respect me. I respect you, but, you know, I don't receive it. Sorry, but I don't receive it. Abnormal is the devil, but not my child. Because I serve a mighty God. I serve the God of the universe. And I worship and I praise him and I'm in love with God. And he knows, you know, how much I love him. So, no. No, but tomorrow they're going to do a sonogram and you're going to see. I said, no, you're going to see. That night we went to a prayer meeting and we started praying, praying, and praying. This happened in New Jersey. And I asked my spiritual father, I said, Pastor Louis, come over here, please, and let's pray for 
my baby. And um, we put our hands on my wife's belly, and we started declaring the mighty, powerful word of God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Great is he that seen you that he's in the world. By your stripes, we were healed. And when I said, when I said that verse, that power, the belly jumped. I said, whoa. And I heard like a, a voice said to me, it is done. It is done. And Stephanie Nicole Nieves was born normal, beautiful like her dad. Hallelujah. So everyone here, I'm sure, has a testimony about the greatness of God. And that's why we are here today, because God is awesome. How many of you feel the presence of God? The Lord inhabits the praise of his people. I just want to share a little bit about the power of praise, which is my line when I left my spiritual pastor in New Jersey over 25 years ago. He prophesied to me, he said, everywhere you go, you're going to share about worship. So I'm going to share a story that we all know, and it's in Acts Chapter 16, verses 16 through 29. But I'm going to do something different here while I read. I'm going to interrupt verses and share what the Lord has placed in my spirit to share with you today. I mean, Act chapter 16, verses 16 through 29. And we read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verse 16 said, once we were going to the place of prayer. This is Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas. We were going to the place of prayer. How many know that the enemy gets mad and tries to interrupt our lives or our path when we're going to go to pray? Because when we pray, we're going to go get connected with God, with our Heavenly Father. And that's something that the enemy doesn't want. He doesn't want you and I to get connected with God. Amen? Everybody understands that very clearly. And um, he really understands about praise because they were going to go and pray. But the story speaks about praise as well. And it says here, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owner, owners by fortune telling. She was a fortune teller. And we all know that's an evil spirit. Amen? She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting. See this, when, 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 when we are committed, when we are committed to follow Christ, to do God's will, to fulfill the assignment that God has assignment to do, the enemy is going to follow you. He will not let you alone. He will always going to bother you. So the day that you don't feel bothered by the enemy, like my father used to say with his broken English, something wrong. Sonny, something wrong. Because when you decide to follow Christ and make a commitment with Christ, the enemy is going to get so mad at you. And he's going to put obstacles in front of your path to try to avoid for you to go closer to God. James chapter 4, I believe it's verse 8. Draw God said, draw to me and I will draw to you. That's what God wants. Because you were created by God. And you were created to serve him and to worship and praise him. Because he has assignment for you. He has a divine purpose in your life. But the enemy knows that. And he tries to distract you with Facebook and, and Instagram and all these TikTok. It's amazing how a short video of 30 seconds could 
catch your attention. Wow, this is interesting, the TikTok. And you stay, stay there. And you don't realize you've been there for an hour and a half watching TikToks. You say, oh, my God, I've been here for an hour and a half watching something that does not edify me. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants to distract, draw your attention, and get you out of the way to, to draw near to God. Am I saying the truth? Amen, right? So while Paul and Silas were going towards a prayer meeting, this witch, I call her witch, this witch came up in front of, started following them. And she started like supposedly shouting, these men are godly men. And they're going to show you how to be saved by God Almighty. But after a couple of days, Paul, he realized that this, her spirit was not right. She had an evil spirit. And he came to her and he rebuked that evil spirit, cast her out, that spirit. So she was a slave. And she had owners. And since she was a fortune teller, she would make money, make money for them. And when, when Paul, through the anointing of God, cast out that evil spirit out of her, well, she lost that power. And her masters got real upset because that's it. They go in my piggy bank. You know, that's it. My golden egg. No more money. So they got so mad and upset with Paul and Silas. And they went to the government and the leaders and, and they locked them up in, in, in prison. You know. Let's keep on reading the story. Hallelujah. It says she earned a great deal of money of her owner for fortune telling. And the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way that, to be saved. She kept this us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said, to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. I remember after 20 years, after 20 years, pastors, being, working for God, so involved, surrounded by godly men, godly women, 20 years, traveling Central South America, all United States, that was my full-time job. My job was to, to go to different places. They invite me to worship God with a trumpet and, and share about the word of God. For 20 years, I forgot about how the world walks and talks and reacts. So after 20 years, things got a little bit slow financially. And I said, I'm going to have to get a job because I have a family. So I got a job in, in a dealership in the service department. So when I got there, I noticed that all the coworkers and the mechanic, they had very filthy mouth. Every sentence, they would say two and three bad words. And I go like this, oh, 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 ouch, 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 ouch. You know, and I forgot. I forgot how people, how the worldly people speaks. It's so filthy. And, and let's just think about the word of God. From the abundance of the heart, of the heart speaks the mouth. I said, whoa, these people are poison. You know, my mother would say something else. Pichona del Diablo, you know, pigeons of hell. Anyway, so I said, God, why did you bring me here? This is hell. You know, and then God spoke to me. He said, wait, 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 wait. You've been preaching a while back that we must be the light of the world. We must be the salt of the world. Now, anywhere we go, the atmosphere must change because we carry the glory of God. How many say amen? And people must notice the presence and the glory of God in our lives because we live in this world, but we are not from this world. We are from the kingdom of God. How many from the kingdom of God? So, I said, man, I got to do something here. So, they were like, before, the, before they go in, they were gathering groups of guys, and all they talk about the, um, the booty of the girls and all these nasty things, you know, fleshy, fleshy stuff, you know, ugly stuff and cursing and smoking, you know. So 
Every morning when, when I was walking past by them, I would like shout and say, Good morning, guys. Bueno dia, muchachos. With a big smile. Good morning, guys. With a big smile. Because that's something that I, I was taught by my dad. My father was a, a perfect example of the joy of the Lord. He was a man full of joy. He was always happy. He was always smiling. He was always saying jokes, clean jokes, clean jokes. You know? He was a peacemaker in the family. So my father, he was so strongly spiritually, but also physically, because he was a workaholic. Dad was always full of joy. I learned that from my dad. Because in Nehemiah said that the, the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. If you feel weak, praise God. And you will feel, be fulfilled with his presence. And his presence brings joy. Amen? So when, we, when you are a worshiper and you praise God, you will never lack of joy. Amen? You will never lack of joy. Even if you go through storms and tribulation, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We need the strength of the Lord. Amen? So, I will walk past by the group. The guy, hey, guys, good morning. God bless you. Hey, good morning. I will say God bless you. Hey, good morning, guys. Buenos dias, muchachos. Good morning. With a big smile. And they will look at me weird. What's wrong with this old man? He's always happy, happy, happy. You know? And I won't say nothing. So every time I walk through the, the shop and I see one of the guys struggling with a tie or something, I will go up to them and say, let me help you. And they look at me weird. Why are you helping me? Why not? You're my coworker. We work together. Let me help you with these tires. Well, nobody else will help. So, I think the pastor said something that the actions speaks louder than words. We don't have to say we're Christian. Just show it. Amen? So I started doing that and listening to God. You must live what you preach. You have to be the light of the world to show the world. So they started noticing that in me. And um, about two months later, I don't know how, someone found out and told the guys, hey, see the bully over there? He's not only a Christian, he's a minister. So that spread around. So the next morning I'm walking by them and they're all smoking and cursing and, you know, talking. And I go, hey, guys, good morning. And they went, oh, shh. Greater is he. Greater is he that's in you. Greater is he that's in me that he's out of the world. The light of, the, the light of Christ is stronger than the darkness. When the light comes in, the darkness will flee, will go. The darkness cannot resist the light of Christ. Amen? That's why it's the same thing of the sound, heavenly sound. When you shout, it's the strongest sound of a human being. Right? If you scream, people go, whoa. When you shout for the Lord, the light of God starts fighting that room. And the darkness gets short of its oxygen and can never and it has to flee. That's what happened when King Saul was tormented by evil spirit. And when David started playing his harp. Those evil spirits flee and left the king Saul at ease. His power and the sound of God and the praise of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How many are enjoying this word? Hallelujah. Gracias, Señor. So that's, in the Bible, there's so many examples about the power of praise. Matthew eleven twelve says, and for and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence taken by force. This is not for 
how, how we say, you know, lazy people. Or, you know, you have to be brave. You have to be brave to show the light of God and the love of God, the passion of God. Because I've learned that to live a sinful life is easy. To live a sinful life is easy. But to live a holy life, you have to be strong. Amen? But God gives you the strength. Amen? Todo lo puedo en Cristo me fortalece. We continue the story in verse 19. When the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our cities into an up uproar by advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined an attack against Paul and Silas, ordered them to strip and be beaten by rods. They beat them up. Just to preach God and, and be nice to people and share the gospel, they were beaten up. How many know that John 10, I like this verse, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to, to give you life and life in abundance. But we have to understand that the enemy has come to destroy us, to kill, to kill his purpose in our lives. He always gonna, he always gonna um, create a trap for our lives. That's why we have to be so connected with God because God will open our eyes to the Holy Spirit. Will open. Be careful, be careful with that person. Don't hang out with that person. That person is poison. The devil's gonna use that person to destroy your spiritual life. So what do you do? You stick, keep it this, say, hi, hi, goodbye, hi, goodbye, hi, goodbye. And you pray for them. But don't stick with them. Because the enemy is going to use them. It's not, you know, but God, the enemy is going to use them to try to destroy your, your spiritual life with God. Am I, am, I, am I explaining myself well here? Because I have Spanish here and then I'm trying to in English. All right? So after they have been severely flogged, they were thrown in prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is my favorite verse here. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. About midnight, Paul and Silas in the inner cell in the jail, in the dungeon, all dark. They started praying and singing hymns to God. They were not complaining to God. Because we've been preaching your word, now they put us in jail. They beat us up. They did not complain. They started praying and praising God. What are we doing? Praying, praying, and praising God. It starts at praying and praising God. Hallelujah. Don't complain. Sometimes we complain. Because we go through uh, tremendous uh, trials and tribulations. But you know what? I, I, I've learned that sometimes God allows. It's our fault. But God, God allows that trial and tribulations. That way we can seek God. One of the countries that really blessed my life, that I was, I was so stunned and, and I was marked, I was so blessed, was Cuba. When I went to Cuba, I went to, 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 share, to share my gift from God to be a blessing, but it turned around. They blessed me because I never seen in other countries that I've been to so much hunger for God. When the service starts at 8 o'clock at night, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and now nobody wants to go home. And if you find this temple, beautiful temple that God has given you, you think you find it small, this is a huge temple in Cuba. And right now, if this temple would have been in Cuba, there will be completely full of people in the aisle, people sitting on the floor, all this here, people sitting on the floor, 
people standing around the wall and 200 people around the window. Why? Because they're going through crisis. When I went to Cuba, they would give a person four eggs a month. Two pounds of rice a month per person. Every man I saw was skinny. And my, when I came back home, my wife said, I brought two, two luggage. And they were empty, empty, empty. She said, where's your clothes? I left them. We are rich. Compared to those people, they're very poor. And I went the second time. And between me and a minister, we took 10 boxes full of, of um, over-the-counter medication, study Bibles, new clothes. I even took a computer with a printer. And I had to pay the guard $200 for he could pass those 10 boxes. That's four years' salary for him. That's how little they make money in Cuba. And I said, you know what? I ain't staying in no hotel. I'm going to live with them. I'm going to eat like them. And I stood with them in their homes. We have service every day. It's a Monday. Every night we have service. And in two weeks, I lost 16 pounds. My wife was very happy. <clears throat> because I ate what they ate. They don't have no eat meat. You know? I said, whoa. But you know what I noticed? They have revival. Can you please repeat that word with me? Revival. revival. Say revival. revival. That's what, that's what's coming to this church. I'm prophesying this right now. That's what's coming to this church, Revival. But in order to, you know where revival starts? Right here. In your heart. That's where revival starts. And then when it comes to your heart, it comes out of your mouth. You praise God. Because the Lord inhabits, the Lord inhabits the praise of people. I went to, to a convention, a youth convention, 2,000 young kids on fire. They were praising God. And I started looking at my wife. I said, they've been on their feet. Praising God for two hours and 45 minutes in a row without stopping. Two hours and 45 minutes in a row praising God without stopping. Whoa. And I felt something supernatural. Power of God. That, word, that song, I Surrender All. I felt fire, God. I said, what is this, God? And I came down the platform. And then went right in the center of the big church. I went like this. And I felt the fire of God cover my head to the toes of my feet. Like a ball of fire. And I felt I started floating in the, I didn't felt the floor. I was like, I said I was floating. I said, I said, God, what is this? He said, Willie, that's my glory. This is my glory. This is my glory. There's a difference between presence of God and the glory of God. And in the Old Testament. It's called La Shakina, Shakina. That's the glory of God. And I thank God that I had that beautiful experience in Cuba because that really marked my life. And like I said, I thought it was going to be a blessing to them, but they really blessed me. And that power of anointing, the apostle Paul had it. That's why he was able to cast out that evil spirit from that witch. Amen. In order to get the oil out of the olive oil, it must be crushed, right? And that's, that's our problem. We don't want to be crushed. We don't want to pay the price. I want to be used by God, but take it easy. No, no. We have to be crushed. We have to crush this flesh because this flesh is to continue battle. With the spirit. I want, I want, I want, I want. But what about what God wants? Remember the prodigal son? Dad, give me all my, my inheritance. Give me all the money. I want, I want, I want. But then he, he ended up going back to his father. Make me a servant. Make me a servant. What do you want? I want to serve you. And that's what, that's what God wants us to serve. To serve him. And to do his will and to praise him. So Paul and Silas started praising God. 
And the Bible says that suddenly, verse 26, there was such a, uh, such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. See, the power of praise is so powerful that it will, it will break the shackles that we have. Some of us need earthquakes to shake us up and open our eyes and realize what God wants. How many can say amen? How many need an earthquake here? Don't, don't raise your hand. I'll pray for you later. But we all need an earthquake to shake us up that we can realize, hey, God has a plan for you. Amen? So when Saul and Paul, Paul and Silas started praising God, there was an earthquake and, and they were all loose. The 27 said the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he was responsible for these prisoners because he thought the prisoner had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for, for lights, rushed, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sir, what must I do to be saved? And that's what happens when, when you walk as a worshiper and be an example. People are going to come up to you and ask you, how can I be like you? How come you're so peaceful and patient and so lovable and always smiling? You know, what, what, what do you have? I, I want what you have. I want what you have. Being a worshiper is a lifestyle. It's a way of living. And there's a world that surrounds them and watching. When they find out that you go to church, they're going to watch you. They're going to see how you talk, how you, how you walk, how you react, your attitude, whatever. See, the attitude speaks. And I'm going to finish with this story that God gave me many years ago when I used to live in South Jersey. I had to cross Tacony Bridge to Philadelphia. And work at the stainless steel company. And I was desperate. This was before I started ministry. I needed a job. And the only position left was very hard physically. They saw me, oh, this guy's six one, he was strong, let's give it to him. And there's about 15 machines that cut the stainless steel. And that creates what they call chips. And the floor would be filled with chips. And my job was with a big giant broom and a big giant shovel. Had a shovel and picked them up and put them in this big uh, basket called a hopper. It's called a hopper. It was made of steel, five by five with wheels. And I had to pick them all up and push that, that hopper all around the, the, the factory. I feel like, like a, a, a slave from Egypt, hallelujah. So hard. And I started asking God, God, you got to help me. This is, this is too hard for me. And God spoke to my spirit. He said, Willie, I'm going to give you a prescription. And you must learn it, live it, and share it. Number one, while you work hard, praise me. Praise me. Praise me. En su presencia hay plenitud de gozo. When you praise God, his presence come. How can, how many can say amen about that? When you praise God, his presence comes. So you praise him, the presence, and when the presence comes, the joy comes. Right? Praise, presence, and joy. And the joy of the Lord is what our, that's the prescription that God gave me. Will he just praise me? And my presence will cover you. And you're going to feel the, my joy. And my joy will give you strength. I said, whoa. That's an awesome prescription. So I started doing that. And we used to work 10 hours a day from Monday to Thursday. And you see, praising God. And God gave me strength. And gave me joy. And I was always happy and singing. But after three months, there was a, a machine operator watching me. He was watching me. After three months, he said, you, come over here. At noon, I need to speak to you alone, you and me by yourself. Okay, cool. When the, the bell rang for lunch, 
Everybody went to the lunch room to have their lunch, and he was in a machine like this waiting for me, like this. And I went up to him. I said, yeah, how you doing? What's going on? He said, you know what? I've been watching. I've been watching you, and that job that you have is not easy. And you always have to. Tell me the truth. You use drugs, right? I said, you know what? You want to call it drug? I call it Jesus Christ. My Lord and Savior. And when I said Jesus Christ, I, I said it from here, from my spirit. And he closed his eyes and bowed his head. And right there, the spirit of God told me, he understands your language. He understands what you're talking about because he is a prodigal son. Born and raised in church. And I put my hand on top of his shoulder. And I said, you know what? You understand my language. Because you were born and raised in church. You'll be saying, who told you? God told me. Your father. Your heavenly father that loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you're doing. He still loves you. And he wants you to return to him. Because he has a purpose in your life. That's it. That's it. There's someone surrounding you that is watching you. That's why it's so important to walk in the light of Christ. And the best way to walk in the light of Christ is just worshiping and praising God. How many can give the Lord a, a hand clap? <laughs> Hallelujah. There's power in praise and worship. And my question to finish right here is, how is your praise and worship in your life? What's the level? What's the level of praise and worship in your, in your life? The Bible says in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be added on to you. So the first thing that when we wake up in the morning, we should be praising God. For another day of life. How many people during the life had a heart attack and they passed away? I know people. I met people. So when I wake up in the morning, I say, thank you, Jesus, for another day of life. Good morning. Good morning, God. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Good morning Holy Spirit. Thank you for another day. Oh, thank you for the air that I breathe. That I could wake up and, and, and go to work, you know, make a living and Support my family. Thank you for my beautiful wife, my kids, my granddaughter. So many blessings that God gives us. And we take such little time to pray and thank God. We have to be grateful. Praise, praise is to recognize what God has done for you. And a grateful heart praises God. Please, please, please believe me when I say this. And I say that with due respect, you know, I don't want to offend nobody here. But when I go to a church, and the pastor don't know how to sing. He don't know how to sing. Don't sing, pastor. Don't sing. He don't know how to sing. He sings awful. But you know what he does? He goes to the congas. And he starts playing congas. He's praising God. He's praising God. You know? And when I notice when the leaders, because I notice this is a pastor, not because he's here. But he's a praiser. I hear him. He always praising God. They understand that the Lord inhabits in the praise of his people. And this is something that is, this is contagious. Pastor, please don't stop. This is contagious. Este es contagioso. No se pega. How many believe in that? And I, I, I'm sorry. I'm taking so much time, Pastor. But I feel my spirit to, to share one more, one more experience that God gave me in Cuba. I was invited to a cathedral, beautiful big church, about 800 people, a very old, old cathedral, beautiful, real high ceiling, a tremendous acoustic, wow. And I got to the church, and I was entering the church, and this little lady like this, small lady, short lady, she said, she saw me with a trumpet in my hand, and she said, is it true that, is it true you play trumpet? I said, yeah, for, for God, yeah. And she said to me, oh, no, 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 I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for you. I said, why? Because our pastor, he doesn't like trumpets. 
his own son plays trumpet. And he will not allow his son to play trumpet in the sanctuary. I said, what? No way. Yes way. Well, you know, I came from the United States. Okay, you better go and pray. Okay, I did what she told me to do. I went to the front in the corner. I got on my knees. I said, God, you brought me over from the United States to this church in Cuba. You brought me here for a purpose. Do your will. Okay. So I got up with faith. I got my trumpet. I started putting oil. The trumpet is so, so prophetic and biblical that it has three pistols, you know, three valves, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And they need lubrication. They need oil. We need oil. We need oil to be used by God. Amen? And I just started preparing my trumpet. And with the corner of my eye, I saw the pastor coming towards me. I said, oh, 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 oh come to pass the Lord. Touch him, touch him, touch him, touch him, touch him, Lord, touch him. So he embraced me, bro, brother Willie Nieves, what a blessing. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, yes, pastor. Let me tell you that this church and this ministry has a story of more than 70, 70 years. And we have some rules and regulations that you must follow. I said, yes, pastor, tell me. Well, here, we don't, we, don't, we don't shout hallelujah. We don't say hallelujah. We don't say gloria a Dios. We don't say amen. We don't applaud. applaud. And this is a, 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 a Protestant Christian church. I said, Pastor, you don't praise God. What do you do then? No, no, no. We worship God only one way. Everyone with their mouth shut. And we're only with one arm. Or the worship with the wiper. Wiper worship. I said, okay. Whoa. I said, God, for real? Serious? All right. Pastor, respect. So when he called me up at my time, I walked up, walking towards the platform, very sadly with my trumpet in my hands, I'm my head down saying to God, God, I don't understand. Not even one little hallelujah. Nothing. So I got to the pulpit and I closed my eyes and I visualized myself in front of the throne of God. I said, God, I have come to worship you and praise you. What I can sense in this place is a spirit of religious tradition. Please, through your anointing, take away this religious tradition in this place. I always learn that we have to let go and let God. 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 Give freedom to the Holy Spirit. So I started playing that song, I Surrender All. Beautiful hymn, I Surrender All. And when I was almost done worshiping the Lord with I Surrender All, the Holy Spirit covered me and I started trembling. I started shaking. I said, what is going on? What is going on? And, and, and when I finished the song, praising, worshiping my Lord, the Lord opened my spiritual eyes. And I saw a beautiful, big, shiny white cloud that covered the whole church above the people's head. But it, it's like a fog, but it's real bright, real white. Covered the whole church, a cloud. And later on, I understood that was the glory of God. I said, whoa. And then God opened my regular, my heart of eyes, and he was standing up going like this. And I saw a lady. <laughs> because the anointing of God descended. The anointing of God, his glory, descended upon his people. Never, never were the same people. To God be the glory. The anointing breaks the yoke. Right? I say the anointing lifts up the, the deaf. The anointing heals the sick. And above everything, the anointing sets us free. Free, 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 free. Freedom to worship God. Amen? A month later, 30 days later, my wife and I were Astonish, surprising, wow. Many levels, many levels, many levels. Many levels. Many levels. Many levels. Many levels. Many levels. A lot of 
letters people wrote to him. And one particular letter was a brother that he wrote to me. He said, Brother Willie, thank you for coming to my church. I've been in this church for 20 years. It was the first time I felt God. The Lord inhabits in the praise of his people. So if you leave this place without feeling the presence of God, it's your fault, not the pastor's fault. Not the worship leaders, the sound guy, it's not their fault. It's up to you if you want to be embraced by the presence of God. That's why I don't cease. I don't get tired of praising God because I love his presence. Amen. There is power. There is power in praise and worship. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Um, I need your prayers. Hallelujah. I need your prayers because I know, I know, I know I'm a, threat, I'm a threat to the devil. He hates my trumpet. I've learned that, and I respect all the musicians. I admire all the instruments. But I found out that the instrument that the devil hates most is the trumpet. Because it's the instrument that God's going to use to lift up his church. Hallelujah. How many agree with me, right? Amen. So he hates me. He hates my guts. Every time I praise God, you know, he has to flee. So I, I want you to pray for me. Keep me in your prayers. Amen. Father God, bless Brother Willie. You don't remember my last name? Willie Trumpet. Willie, Willie the Trumpet guy. Trumpeta. You know, Willie Trumpeta. He knows. Trumpeta. Second, we're working right now on our new recording. It's been 10 years that I don't record. And I'm working on a new project. It's going to come out powerful, awesome. So I need you to pray for this project that God will provide me the funds. And we also brought our music. We have CDs. And now the new thing is USB pen drives for the car and your computer. So I have 31 songs in each pen drive. And we also accept your credit card or debit card, okay? How many going to pray for me? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. How many love the Lord? We're so grateful and thankful. Amen. For uh, God blessing us with touching uh, Evangelist Willie Nieves' heart coming today. That was a, a blessing. Uh, he's been a blessing each time I've heard him before, as well as the time past that he was here with us. Amen. He's been a blessing. We're thankful and grateful to God for that. And let's continue to pray for him. For God to continue to use him. For God to continue to open doors before him that no man can shut. Amen? So that he can continue taking uh, uh, the word of God as well as uh, praise and worship. We know that when our praise goes up, the walls come down. Our praise goes up, the walls come down. And we know when we go before the presence of God like David, that's why David took off his robe. Why? Because in the presence of God, you ain't no king. In the presence of God, you ain't no pastor. Right? When you go before God, you take all that off. Amen? You get, you get and spiritually naked before God. And you praise and you worship God in spirit and in truth. That's powerful. Amen? And so necessary today. Because that's how we push through. We all look at the story of Jacob, chapter 32, the book of Genesis. We look at the story of Jacob, right? And we see there's a breakthrough. Right? There's a breakthrough because we know who Jacob once was. He was a trickster. He was a prankster, right? That's the title he had. That's how people would describe him, right? They didn't take him seriously, right? They, 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 why? Because he was known as that. But when he had his breakthrough, when he grabbed the hold of God, when he grabbed the hold of the angel of the Lord, and he told him, I ain't going to leave until you bless me, that's what we got to do sometimes for that breakthrough. Whatever it is that you're asking God for, Whatever it is that thing that you're hoping for, whatever expectation you got from God, sometimes you got to wrestle with God to get it. You got to fight for that breakthrough. You got to fight for that blessing. 
Many of us will get up uh, very early in the morning and, uh, and do the things that we got to do. We want that job. We want to be the first in line to, to get that interview, right? We want that job. We want that breakthrough. We'll say whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll do whatever. We, we need, that, we need that, uh, that extra salary, that extra money to provide for our family. How much more with God? Huh? The temporary things could do but so much. They could bring us gratification, but they'll never bring us satisfaction. But when we wrestle with God and we get that breakthrough, the Bible teaches us, just like Jacob, it wasn't a change in name. It wasn't that people literally started calling him Israel or could literally change the name. It had nothing to do. There was a shift in his heart. There was a shift in his inner man. He went from being known as a, as a prankster, as a trickster, to being a man of integrity and a man of character. And that's what we want. That's what we fight for. And that's why sometimes on Sunday, you know, uh, uh, we, you know we, we, we're constantly praising and worship. I told you that before and I'll tell you again. If I had to classify myself, it wouldn't be pastor, evangelist. You know, I am what God called me. I, I get that. I receive that. I accept that. But I want to be called a worshiper. And worship God in spirit and truth. To lay everything else aside. Right? And say, you know what, Lord, here I am to worship you, to praise you, not only for what you've done in my life, because if I have it, if I don't, I know that you're God and you're sitting on your throne. You're worthy of worship and praise. Man, whether you accept it or I accept it or not, the reality is one day this is all going to end. Whether it's at the sound of the trumpet or God calls you before, it doesn't matter. One thing's for sure, one day this is going to end. Huh? And do you want to stand before God like I want to stand before God and I want to hear my faithful servant? You were able to push through to all the nonsense here on earth. You were able to push through the bickering, the conflict. You were able to push through the shortcomings, right? And then hear the voice of God, my faithful servant, and who I am well pleased. I don't know about you, but I want God to be pleased with me. This ain't about pleasing man. This ain't about man being content with you. This ain't about man accepting you. This ain't about man. The Bible says to those that please God, I want to please God. If you want to please God, stand with me. If you don't, have, don't worry about it. Have a seat. It's okay. But this is about pleasing God, man. Huh? This work doesn't belong to man. This work belongs to God. At the end of the day, man, we want God to do and to move as he wants to move. Amen? And we want the Spirit of God. Like he was talking, you know, we, we teach that on a regular. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. The seal of God, the presence of God, that's a down payment. That's a guarantee that we belong to God and that one day he's going to come back and get what's his. Amen. Praise God. But then there's power. There's too many that went and very little that sent. We don't want to go. We want to be sent by God. And if God told the apostles that stood with them for three and a half years, right? They stood with God. They seen the power of God. They knew what Jesus could do. They saw a resurrected Jesus with the same marks in his hand. But yet Jesus told them, don't leave until you receive power. Don't go into the highways and byways. Don't go into the, 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 the prostribulos. Hallelujah. Don't go into the strip clubs. Don't go into the ghetto. Be careful. Wait till you receive power from above. Don't be one that went, but be one that sent. Because when God sends you, he equips you, he trains you, and he prepares you. But when you go and you ain't ready, we already know what happened in the books of Acts. The devil took three men, stripped them, and beat them up, huh, and sent them away naked. Why? Your name ain't registered in hell. We don't know you. Huh? Be careful. But we're in an hour in the last days, amen? So raise your hands to heaven. I'm going to pray for everybody here, amen? But we're going to pray, amen, a supernatural miracle of God in your life. In this time, in this hour, you came here hoping for something. You came here expecting something. And we don't want you leaving without receiving that, amen? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray and we glorify your name. We're so thankful once again for this beautiful day. A day that you made, O oh Lord. A day that you made for us to rejoice and to be glad in it, Lord, and we're glad. 
We're rejoicing, O oh Lord. We're rejoicing for your presence that has been felt here today. We're rejoicing for the power, Almighty God, of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, like Jacob, Almighty God, we're wrestling for that blessing. We're wrestling what you have for us. We're wrestling, oh Lord. We want that blessing, Almighty God. We want that shift and that change in our lives, Almighty God. We no longer want to walk as natural men, but we want to walk as men filled with the power of your Holy Spirit, Almighty God. You said that the works that you did and even greater, we shall be doing. We want those works. We want to be doing those things, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray over your church. I pray over this house. Lord, that's been covered by the blood. We know that you began this work. And we know that everything that you begin, you will perfect and you will finish, my God. Bless your people. Bless your children, almighty God, that have been here today to hear the word, oh Lord. That word, that seed. We receive that seed. That is the seed that we receive. We don't receive the seed of conflict. We don't receive the, the seed of gossip. We don't receive the seed of the enemy. We receive that word that was here received today. A, a seed of prayer and praise. And that's the same seed that we're going to take out and sow. All for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.